four, five. All right, everyone. So we are going to be taking a look at a game that was played today in the fourth round between two of the co-leaders, Anish Giri and Magnus Carlsen. Now, in this, in this game, Anish has the white pieces, Magnus has the black pieces. It's worth noting, of course, it's a fairly historical moment because 12 years ago, Anish Giri beat Magnus Carlsen in the same Tata Steel event, and it was Anish's first win against Magnus, and to date, his last win. So let's jump right into the game. So the game starts with d4. We get knight f6, c4, e6, knight to f3, b6, queen's Indian defense, g3, bishop a6, queen c2, bishop b7, bishop g2, c5, d5. Now, one story and one of the things that people love about my recaps and just my general knowledge is that there are a lot of insider stories that I have. Now, around 2015 or 16, I was in a taxi with the former world chess champion, Vladimir Kramnik on my way to the closing ceremony. And in this taxi ride, one of the people who's in the cab asked Kramnik, have you ever had an idea where you prepared it for a long time? You didn't use it in a certain game. You saved it to be able to use down the road. And Kramnik alluded to this very specific idea in the Queen's Indian defense with this Queen C2, D4, D5 pawn sacrifice. Now, of course, as people know histor from history, this was played very prominently by the another former world chess champion, Veselin Topolov, who gets all the credit for this idea, even though Kramnik had this idea long before Topolov did. So the game goes, game continues with pawn takes pawn, knight takes pawn, castles, bishop e7, we get rook to d1, knight to c6, queen f5, white cannot play rook takes d5 because then there's knight b4 forking the queen and the rook. So we get queen to f5, knight to f6, e4, b6, e5, queen d7. All this is theory. Trade takes takes, rook e1, king f8, knight to c3, and knight to b4. Now, this is worth noting because this position has been reached before. It's reached in a game in 2008, played between the famous Norwegian world chess champion Magnus Carlsen and one of the best Swiss players, Yannick Pelletier. Now, in that game, uh, bishop g5 was played by Magnus. Here, however, Anish plays knight e5. Now, what's worth noting about this uh, specific situation is you can already tell from the bar that white is quite a bit better. However, in my opinion, Magnus played this opening because, because he figured maybe Anish wouldn't be super prepared. Maybe he wouldn't play his pawn sacrifice line against the Queen's Indian. And third, if they reach this position, even though white is a little bit better, it is a queenless middle game, which is Magnus's forte, and Magnus would be able to outplay Anish. We get knight takes knight, bishop takes bishop, rook d8, rook d1, guarding the pawn on d6, of course. We get knight to c4, which is played here. We get knight c4, we get b7, knight to c2, rook to b1. And here we get this move, knight to d4, which is a mistake by Magnus. Now, in this position, it's worth noting the computer actually thinks after this move, knight to e5, going after the pawn on d7, that black is probably relatively okay. White is still better after bishop to f4, but the show goes on at any rate. So instead, we get knight to d4 being played here. We get Pawn to b4, a very, very strong move, by the way, being played by Anish here, because after playing this b4 move, white tries to undermine this classic bastion here in the center of the board. You have a great knight on d4, which is guarded by all the pawns, but by playing b4, you undermine the bastion. You also try to open up the b5 for this rook on b1, so it's a very, very good conceptual move and very impressive move. It is, of course, also the best move in the position as well. So here, Magnus plays rook takes d7. Of course, Magnus is not a computer, so he can't play the very obvious computer move, pawn to h5 here, which only leaves white with an advantage after moves like bishop a6 or bishop to d5. Again, h5, such an obvious move for a 3500 player, but for us puny humans, not obvious at all. So here, Magnus blunders with rook takes d7. After this move, there is no coming back here. We got bishop to d5, attacking the knight on c4, also, when black moves the knight, now white can take the pawn on c5 and open up the classic b line, as Tarek would say, to, for the rook on b1 to go down to b8. So we get b takes c5, b takes c5. Now here, instead of rushing with rook to b8, white has this move bishop a3. Another excellent move here, going after the weak pawn on c5, undermining the classic bastion. There's a pin towards the king on f8. And there is still rook to b8 as well. So black is in a lot of trouble here. And already the computer thinks... So this is game over. Black can just resign. So we're on move number 26, and Magnus Carlsen has a completely lost position against Anish Giri. Now, as we know, Anish historically, he's struggled sometimes in positions where he's winning. He's earned the name, I think they call it Draw Giri or something along those lines. Drawnish Giri is what they call him sometimes. But the position is so overwhelming that Anish would have to do an amazing job to snatch a draw from the jaws, snatch a draw from the jaws of victory. So we get King to E7. 
Bishop takes pawn on c5. Now the bastion no longer exists here. We get knight to e6. Bishop b4 is played here. Now white could play a move like knight e4. Computer actually thinks it's the best move here. But after knight takes rook c7, to us humans, it's not very obvious why this is simply a win. But after rook to e1 and king d8, knight to a6, followed by knight b4 and knight c6, it's just simply over here. So instead, Anish plays the human move. He plays bishop b4, keeps the pin alive. As we say when we're teaching beginners, there's a classic phrase, pin to win. So Anish keeps the, keeps the pin alive here with bishop b4. Magnus plays a5. Now, this is a desperation move. Magnus clearly sees both knight e4 and knight b5 lurking here, where white will win a ton of material because the knight on d6 uh, will fall. And he plays a5. Computer says that after bishop c3, bishop c3, knight f5. Black is still worse here, but there are chances to hang on. But optically, with the double op combo, these knights are a little bit loose here. No bastions. Rooks are perfectly placed. It feels very hard to play. That being said, I do feel like Magnus on his best state would probably find this. But I also suspect that for Magnus, he already was completely tilted. He's like, what the heck is going on? On each place, pawn sack line comes out guns blazing. Uh, and he just simply, he couldn't sort of recover mentally here. So he plays a5 here, which just hangs upon. It does break the pin temporarily, but now after rook c8, Anish correctly plays knight a4. He puts the knight on the rim, but the knight is coming right back into the game immediately. You're going to go knight b6 and fork the rooks on d7 and c8. Magnus tries knight c4 here, desperately trying to trade off some pieces, because after bishop takes knight, yay chess.com yay thank you so much for doing that so we're gonna get some spoiler alerts once again but we're much further along with our recap so that that is light so we get knight c4 hoping for bishop takes c4 rook takes rook rook takes rook and rook takes c4 now white is only up a pawn here but after knight b6 even this would be bad but after rook d4 there are some small chances to maybe survive and save the game so instead we get rook b to c1 which is again the perfect move here as we say to beginners when you start playing the game of chess, pin to win. So we get rook to c1 being played here. Now we get bishop to e5 being played by Magnus. Sword doesn't really do anything here, but if white takes the knight, for example, again, black can trade the rooks, and he's only down a pawn. So he goes bishop e5. Anish plays bishop b4, saving the bishop on a5, checking the king at the same time. We get king to f6 being played here. And now Anish plays the best move once again. Knight to c5. Knight takes knight. Rook takes knight. Again, we have a live pin of this knight on c5. Rook dc7 is played. And after bishop to a5, Magnus Carlsen, the world champion, resigns for a second time against Anish Giri, 12 years to the day. And it's, he resigns simply because the position is hopeless. If you go rook a7, I have bishop b6. Uh, forking the rook in the knight with the bishop and winning material if you go to e7 as well for example white can simply go f4 or even rook d to c1 creating a new pin once again and if you go rook to d7 which is the other possibility here after rook to d7 white goes bishop b6 here and you're simply going to lose the knight you can go bishop d6 but after rook c1 as we say before pin to win is the name of the game and white will win material here but for those reasons, Magnus resigns against Anish. Anish wins a big, big game. As I said, it's fairly ironic, that, or ironic, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's like uh, poetic, I should say, that 12 years today from the first time and last time that Anish beat Magnus, he wins for a second time in Tata Steel with the white pieces. A masterful game. Really nothing bad that I can say about the way Anish played. He played a, pretty much a perfect game from start to finish, and he takes the sole lead for the time being in the Tata Steel Masters with three points out of five. So very, very big win for Anish. Magnus, of course, world champion. He'll probably find a way to recover, but that's it for now. So if you guys like this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button or follow button below, and we'll keep it coming. Hope you guys enjoyed the recap. Okay, you guys, back to chess in the meantime. Here we go. Uh, we are going to keep rolling. Big shout out to everybody who is watching on Twitch, obviously. Uh, no, <laughs> no. So outro plays bye, 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 bye. Exactly. But uh, jokes aside, of course, very big win. My general take is this. Magnus disrespected Anish. He did not think Anish would be super prepared for the Queen's Indian. And I think when Anish came out blitzing out this pawn sacrifice line, Magnus was confused. He was not expecting it. That tilted him a little bit. He tried to bluff a little bit with this line, and it just did not work out. So a big, big shout-out to Anish Giri once again. A huge, huge victory for him. Second time that he has beaten uh, Magnus Carlsen, and it's a crushing victory. So very, very impressive. Let's not forget that Anish also should have won in round one against Fabiano Caruana. Uh, in that game, it wasn't 
quite winning enough, so he found a way to snatch a draw from the jaws of victory. But nonetheless, he's won two games in a row. He has two, or not two in a row, but he's won, uh, he's won, he's won two games out of the first four, and he is just on fire. So very, very good stuff from Anish. All right, you guys, let's put the music back on. Let's keep rolling.